Good afternoon and happy Wednesday to everyone here covering this and as well as to all of my fellow Mississippians. Uh, as we have said now since uh, late July, early August, uh, Mississippi has been improving. But we also have also we have also been saying that the threat is not gone. We saw numbers today that do not fit the downward trend in COVID-19 cases, and it is a reminder that nothing is inevitable. Our actions as a people dictate the results. I'm a numbers guy, not a narrative guy. I've always said that I'll tell you when the numbers are good, and I'll tell you when the numbers are bad. Numbers had been very, very good today. They're not so good. In fact, they're bad. Admittedly, it's just one day. It's not a trend, but it is important to notice it and to acknowledge it. And we'll talk a little bit about, potentially, what's causing it. Please continue to do those things that we know have an impact. Mask work. The numbers from the last few weeks bear that out. Please continue to avoid unnecessary social gatherings. Parties cause spread nearly every time. Ignoring the rules, not paying attention to our suggestions and in many instances our executive orders to wear a mask to stay socially distanced matters. The worst thing we can do right now is let our guard down. As I have said repeatedly, over the last three weeks, we have basically cut our numbers in half. The decision we have to make today and yesterday and tomorrow is are we going to step on it? Are we going to try to cut it in half again? Or are we going to let our guard down? Are we going to let it, the downward trend plateau here and then perhaps even turn around? And that is not what we need to do. If we want to keep our kids in school, if we want to keep our colleges open, if we want to have an opportunity to have college football, we have to remain vigilant. We have to take the community spread that we have today and continue to reduce it, to keep that or not below one, to continue to see numbers coming down. Again, we're certainly not going to panic based upon today's number over 1,300 cases today. You'll, as I told you yesterday, our seven-day average as of yesterday was right at 700. Now, Wednesdays are typically larger than other days. We know that. We've seen that throughout this pandemic. But we have to be aware of the data. We have to pay attention. We have to stay strong. We have to protect our neighbors. We have to protect our family we can come together and do this. In fact, over the last six weeks, we have been doing it. But we've got to keep driving things down. We've got to keep using our head. We've got to realize that if we do the little things now, it will have an impact two weeks, three weeks, four weeks out. So I want to encourage all of my fellow Mississippians to continue down that path. At this time, I'm going to ask Dr. Dobbs to give us an update on the numbers. Uh, thank you very much, Governor. Today we're reporting 1,348 new cases of coronavirus, um, a considerable increase over what we saw a couple days ago. But I would like to remind everyone to understand that there will be variability, and we do see a little bit of a lag after the weekends and then uh, sort of resetting in the middle of the week. We will have to follow it over some days to see what kind of trend we're going to see, but still unwelcome news nonetheless. And if we look at the number of deaths, we have 31 new deaths among Mississippians. And we need to realize that uh, these are people who did not have to die. These are people who otherwise would be with us today. Most of the people who are dying today in Mississippi are not in nursing homes. They're people who live in the community. They're contracting COVID and they're getting sick and, and they're dying. So it's something we really need to work diligently to suppress in the community so that it doesn't reach people vulnerable and healthy, some of whom are, are gonna sadly die. If we look at what's going on in the school situation, um, if we look at the uh, cases that were reported in the last week from August 10th, to August 14th, we reported um, uh, 84 additional 
uh, teachers uh, who um, contracted, who were diagnosed with coronavirus, an additional 132 students with um, uh, a number of total students quarantined last week of 1,970 and teachers and staff 328. So we still have a lot of headwinds as far as kids coming into school with coronavirus, but I would like to commend our school systems for, for jumping on this. This high number is an indication of the seriousness with which they're taking it. And if we're gonna have a successful in-person, you know, next month or so, it's gonna take this sort of aggressive isolation and quarantine approach as well as the preventive measures to make sure that we can successfully uh, get through the school year. Some schools will have to close temporarily. Um, it's inevitable, um, so just be prepared for that. Um, the other thing is I would like to mention that teacher testing is available. Um, if you go to our website or to the UMC website, teachers can sign up for free testing. Right now it's only going to be at the existing rotational sites and the West Street, but starting Monday we'll have our <coughs> our teams and all the county health departments on that rotation. And so stay tuned, that'll be available starting next Monday. Um, if we're talking about colleges, we're extremely concerned about colleges. Um, we've seen uh, certainly across the country, a lot of sit situations where people have ha actually had to close college right after they opened it. And certainly that's not something that we wanna see. Um, we are investigating two outbreaks, one at um, Ole Miss and one at Mississippi University for Women. The one at the, at the W um, uh, has some trace back um, to the Cotton District in Starkville. Not a big surprise, right? Um, we know when people socialize and get in groups concentrated, not wearing masks, they're absolutely gonna, gonna spread the coronavirus. So we will continue to investigate more, so expect more information as we go forward um, on that front. And uh, Governor, that's all I have today. Thank you, Dr. Dobbs. Uh, just as a reminder, I know Erica, I believe, had asked a couple of days ago about the data from the White House. I believe we got her that information. We did do a call with the White House Coronavirus Task Force yesterday. Um, it was very focused on long-term care facilities and, and the need and the desire uh, and, and what's ultimately going to be the requirement for weekly testing of nursing home um, employees. Uh, that's being driven uh, by the uh, CMS, and obviously they're going to be receiving rapid tests uh, being di distributed over the next six weeks or so. Uh, that is certainly an effort that we support. Uh, we, we are going to continue to monitor that and support that as well. But as I mentioned uh, three weeks ago, uh, our total number of cases over the seven-day period, and that's Saturday to Friday, uh, is the data that they look at. It was 9,100 two weeks ago. That number was 6,700. Uh, last week, that number was 5,496 cases over that seven-day period. Um, that uh, showed Mississippi uh, having approximately 185 cases per 100,000 residents. That compared to uh, the number of 171 in our uh, FEMA HHS region, obviously slightly higher, uh, but not significantly so. With respect to test positivity, which has obviously been uh, a topic that is of interest certainly to some in the national media, uh, our test positivity for that seven day period was 12.4%. Uh, that was in comparison to our FEMA HHS regional average of 11.0. So again, test positivity a little bit higher uh, than the region, but not a lot. Uh, there's a lot of uh, factors that go into that, a lot of reasons. One of the things that we'll see is, is our testing numbers in, in large part uh, are driven by demand. So as people feel better as, and they're not going to get tests, uh, testing comes down because we're not seeing mandatory testing in a lot of facilities uh, throughout our state. Um, Many of our tests, uh, in fact, a majority of our tests are, are done at private labs. And if individuals are not feeling sick, they're not going to their local doctor, they're not getting tested. Um, obviously, the state health lab is doing uh, a lot of random tests. They did it in Holmes County. They're doing it, I think, uh, I don't know if you've announced this, but in Choctaw in the next couple of days. Um, and so th they're doing significant uh, testing out in the communities, but again, Testing, total testing numbers are driven uh, as much by demand as anything else. Um, so our, our numbers are 12.4%, uh, still too high, uh, 
but also um, headed in, in the right direction slowly uh, but surely. As I mentioned yesterday, uh, that number of total tests, excuse me, total positives on a seven-day average had come down to about 700. We had approximately 4,900 total positive cases in the uh, previous seven days through yesterday uh, with today's number. Uh, last Wednesday was the largest total number of positive tests that were reported in any given day for almost a 14-day period. Uh, that was just under 1,100, so today's 1,300 plus is actually up week over week over the same day. Um, those additional 200 cases are going to put us uh, back over uh, approximately 5,000 uh, over a seven-day period, uh, which is uh, certainly not the direction we want to go, but it is one day. But it is important to note that the things that we're doing today are going to have an impact on positive tests two weeks from now and four weeks from now. So let's continue to stay vigilant. Let's continue to work. With that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to our director, Director Michelle of Mississippi Emergency Management Agency, who wants to talk a little bit, I think, looking at the maps, uh, the fact that we are in hurricane season and there are, are numerous storms east of Florida. Yes, sir. Thank you, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, unfortunately, we do have a storm update to give everyone. But uh, first, let me give you a quick update on the COVID Emergency Relief Fund. As of today, uh, we have received 693 applications uh, for uh, the Emergency Relief Fund. Of those uh, number of applications, we've only received about 26 projects. Now, what that means is we've got a number of, of applications that have come in, then we have validated applications as far as the applicant itself, but as far as actual work projects, we've only gotten about 26. The good news is uh, we've gotten about $8 million worth of projects just over the last 24 hours, so we're starting to see the counties uh, push those projects in. So I want to encourage the counties and municipalities to do that. We are rapidly approaching our October 15th uh, deadline for submission, so it's very important that you do that to give us the opportunity to wrap everything up before we transfer funds uh, over or to the governor. Uh, one of the things that we talked about uh, last week with the Associated Supervisor, we'll be talking with them again tomorrow, is about payroll expense for public health and public safety. A lot of information out there that's going to be a big one if counties and municipalities take advantage of that and do that right and quantify that information accurately. Uh, that's going to be a big ticket item for counties and municipalities to be able to take advantage of. And we'll be talking about that more tomorrow. So tropical update. We're currently watching three systems that are moving uh, across uh, and into the Caribbean basin. Only two of those thus far have been named. Uh, the first one is Invest 97 Lima. Um, that one has a more southerly track, and right now it's tracking and is projected to, if it continues along the same modeling track, and things are still very iffy on that, we could see potential landfall of that somewhere along the Gulf Coast uh, line, whether it be Louisiana, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, or even Florida, very un in the next five, seven days. The second system out there is 98 Lima, Invest 98 Lima. It is tracking a little bit more to the north. Uh, you're looking at about another uh, seven to ten days. We'd be just right behind this system if it were to make landfall and come in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, again, the spaghetti models on both these systems are still very iffy, and the intensity models that we're looking at right now are showing them as low risk. But let me just let me just reiterate to everyone: once these storms enter the Gulf of Mexico, they become very uh, unpredictable. So these storms could intensify very quickly. So out there, as you're watching these storms, pay close attention. Continue to be prepared uh, to evacuate if necessary. And then finally, that third system that's out there is still just a tropical wave coming off the coast of Africa. It's still uh, very undeveloped, so we'll continue to watch that one along the way. Uh, so keeping our eyes tuned, Governor, uh, as these systems develop. Thank you. And we will continue to monitor these potential tropical storms, potential hurricanes. We'll continue to pray uh, that they stay away from the Gulf and that they stay out in the Atlantic Ocean and go uh, and do not hit landfall for either us or any of our friends uh, around the country or around the globe. With that, I'm going to open the floor to questions, and we'll start with Scott. Can you add any more detail to these outbreaks at Ole Miss and MUW? Were they clusters in dorms or anything of that nature that could shed some detail on what we're looking into? Uh, we, we're still investigating. We, these, we're just made aware of these today. Um, they um, appear to be from external sources, and then they got into different parts of the university. Um, 
Well, I don't know enough really to say much right now. I know the W is going to do a press release, and they may have already, um, about what the cases are. So as we get more information, I'll let you know. It's just so preliminary. I will say, though, that the teams have done a fantastic job up there with their investigations. It's, it's, it's encouraging that they've gotten on it so fast and so aggressively. But still, it's such a challenge when we have so much, so much disease coming in to starting school. That's what I was wondering. Does Holman just got in? How did they detect it so quickly? As a uh, cluster outbreak. They are doing some routine testing of some of their groups, yeah. and, and that's that's my understanding of how they tested all those folks. Yes, ma'am. Governor, you, you talked a little bit about the testing and how a lot of times those numbers are very much driven by the demand. Dr. Dobbs, I believe that you spoke about it a couple of weeks ago in terms of if we see testing numbers down, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It may indicate a good thing because not as many people are feeling sick. Can you guys? Speak to that a little bit more, and if you anticipate that we will see numbers going up, you talked about the initiative for long-term care facilities, we've talked about teachers being tested, so do we anticipate, particularly with schools going back and that with long-term care facilities, that we'll see those numbers tick back up since they've been pretty low here lately? Well, I certainly think that's a possibility, and, and so I think um, one of the things that, that we have learned as we've gone through the last six or seven months is um, you know, if, if we're seeing, if we're detecting positive cases because we're being proactive by testing individuals that are asymptomatic, whether it be nursing home, uh, nursing home employees, uh, whether it be our program to test our teachers or our program as Dr. Dobbs and his team are doing to test in the community, um, detecting those cases is a very positive thing because if you can detect those asymptomatic cases, then that by definition will help limit the spread because you're able to isolate those individuals and also those individuals that have come in contact with others. So those numbers um, going up is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, you know, obviously, and the president gets criticized uh, about this a lot, but if you do zero tests, you have zero positive cases, right? And so having said that, in the, in the private labs, um, that is much more of an indicator of real community spread because these are individuals that are making a conscious decision to go to their doctor. They're going because they feel bad, and as they go and because they feel bad and the number of tests go up and the number of positives go up, that is more of an indicator of community spread that is occurring, and, um, and that's certainly not a, a positive uh, development. So. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, in, if, if you look at our um, how it tracks with our positivity rate, they, they, they track pretty tightly. And so it really reflects community transmission and then community demand by illness. It's, it's, it's not really surprising. Um, there are almost two different types of tests, right? There's our surveillance and then our sort of our symptom-based testing. And so our symptom-based testing, based testing is going to be the predominant number of tests that people are doing through the private system. Um, and we do want to do more and more surveillance. Um, but, you know, people don't want to get tested. They don't like it. So unless you're feeling bad, a lot of people don't want to do it. Although tomorrow, I will say, when we're going to be um, uh, at the Silver Star um, parking lot at, uh, um, at, with the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians, but also surrounding people who want them to come, we're going to do the front of the nose, not the back of the nose. So it's going to be a lot, it's going to be a lot easier. So come on in, get the front of the nose test, not the back of the nose. And we'll even be doing some throat swabs for kids. So um, that, I think it drives it. If you're in and around Neshoba County, um, please take advantage of this opportunity uh, to, to go be tested. Um, I have been tested many times, uh, more than I would have liked, uh, including uh, within the last few hours. And so I just want to encourage people to get tested. Um, testing, is, there, there is the test that is pretty invasive, and I have done that, and it is not fun. But the front of the nose test is not nearly as invasive. It, is, um, it can be done. I really do encourage, particularly um, uh, our friends uh, in the Choctaw Nation, uh, because that is an, uh, an area that we all know there have been hit really hard here, and, and quite frankly, um, similar groups around the country have been hit hard as well. So, Joe. Governor, I, I guess I'm just trying to wrap my head around, and a lot of viewers are, that we are celebrating five days of cases going down, and then this jumps up to 1,300 cases today. Are we, and testing seems to have been going down, and 
you attribute some of that to people not feeling uh, either are asymptomatic and not even going to the doctor, you know. Shouldn't we be beefing up testing at this moment considering we have all of these people coming from out of state into state, then we have people going to school. Shouldn't we be leaning on the federal government to send more resources to Mississippi? Well, we, we certainly need to be looking at ways to uh, increase testing uh, capacity and increase testing capabilities. Uh, that's the reason that we announced a couple of days ago uh, the opportunity for teachers uh, that want to get tested to be able to get tested. And so we have created 16 teams, as Dr. Dobbs has said, starting on Monday uh, that will be distributed uh, evenly throughout the state of Mississippi going to uh, the public health departments in these various counties that will be offering testing uh, to our teachers. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we also need uh, to continue to uh, look for ways to improve uh, testing capabilities in, in other places. But no matter what we do as a government, we're still going to find ourselves in a position where the majority of testing is going to take place in, in individuals' doctor's offices, and the majority of the test is, no matter what we do, is going to be uh, produced and, and then provided the information to us, to the Department of Health, by private labs. That's just the, that's the, the nature of where we find ourselves, and I think that's the way it should be. But yes, we need to continue to always look for ways uh, to, to give people more and more opportunities for testing. But I think one of the points that Dr. Dobbs makes repeatedly, and it's right, um, I'm not going to mandate that everybody in Mississippi get a test. And if people don't feel bad, Mississippians just aren't, <laughs> they're not likely to just go say, well, I'm having a great Wednesday. What am I going to do this afternoon? Well, let's go get a test. Well, that's just not very realistic. And so uh, certainly uh, in those areas, we've got to make sure we have the testing capacity where if there is an outbreak uh, in a particular uh, school or a particular college or a particular community uh, where additional testing needs to happen very, very quickly uh, as we're quarantining individuals, uh, then we certainly need that capacity. And I think by and large, we, we have. We, we've shown that if we need to surge testing, we have the ability to do so. Um, and maybe that'll be necessary in the coming days and weeks. Yes, sir. Dr. Dobbs, on those uh, college outbreaks, are those just two, uh, two, one student per college, or is it multiple students in the universities? Um, it's multiple students within specific groups. Um, there'll be more information coming, but it's, it's quite a few students. It, it'll, it'll be a considerable number of students when, once it's all said and done. We're still actually waiting on lab results on a lot of them, honestly. And, uh, Governor, um, you quoted the president a moment ago saying that uh, if you don't test people, you come back with, uh, you don't get new cases. Would it be more accurate to say you don't get more uh, documented cases? Sure. No, that, that's fine. Yeah. I'll buy that. Yes. Um, Dave Elliott from WLOX has a question. Thank you, Renee. I have a question for Dr. Dobbs, and then if I may, a follow-up for the governor. Uh, Dr. Dobbs, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was all about stopping the spread, shifted to flattening the curve, then concern over positivity rate after we reopened, back to stopping the spread. Now it seems like we're fixated on the seven-day average. What data points do you really look at? What tells the most important story to you? You know, we look at multiple data points because it, it's it's the entire narrative that's most important. And one of the things that, well, and, and I don't want to be overly um, reassured by it, but all of our metrics, if we look at the um, the COVID-like illness rate on our, on, our, on our syndromic surveillance, which you can see on our website, the hospitalization numbers, the mortality, and the case numbers, on average, are all improving. So I think we have made some improvement, there's no doubt, uh, but we can't erode, we don't really need to let that erode because we are facing a monumental challenge with schools and now colleges um, uh, out there. One of the things about testing, testing is very important, there's no doubt about it, we got to find who's out there, but nothing is more important than the simple behaviors that prevent transmission. There's no amount of testing that's going to compensate for dangerous behaviors. It's just, it's absolutely impossible because you can expose yourself every single day. We can't test every Mississippian every single day. If we could, then maybe we would be able to. Um, but, you know, we are improved. It's still not great. It's not even good, but it's better. And what we're doing, if we'll just do the six feet of mask in small groups, we'll be in a lot better shape. So please, please keep up the effort. Uh, Governor. 
There's been uh, inconsistent information on the so-called enhanced federal employment benefits uh, from the president's executive orders. At first, 400 weekly states would have to chip in 100. Governors like you objected. Now the White House seems to be saying that if a state is already paying at least $100, they don't have to chip in the extra uh, 100, which would be good news for an unemployment trust fund. Uh, has your office confirmed that? And if true, do you support that? Yeah, well, thank you for the question, uh, Dave. What I would tell you is this. Uh, we have been in very, very regular contact uh, with the powers that be uh, with respect to the enhanced unemployment benefits. Um, I, I do believe that we can utilize the monies that we are paying for unemployment now as our match. I believe that has been confirmed. Uh, both the uh, leadership at the Mississippi Emergency Management Agency and at the Mississippi Department of Employment Security have been in touch with both FEMA and the Department of Labor. And I would anticipate that we will have an announcement as to our decision as to whether or not we're going to um, implement that program uh, at tomorrow's press conference. We are trying to get final details today. My guess is that we will have an announcement, final announcement as to whether or not we're going to apply uh, tomorrow afternoon. But yes, it does appear that you can accept $300 for all of those that are unemployed due to COVID, utilize the state um, payments as the $100 match, because as you know, uh, there, there is no uh, the 22 to $23 million a week that it could cost us for that $100 uh, is a no-go for us and, and I think for a lot of other states. And so we have been in contact. We believe that we have guidance now that we can uh, utilize the, um, the current payments as our match and we'll make a final decision uh, within the next uh, literally 18 hours, and I'll announce it tomorrow at 2.30 at, at the press conference. Um, one of the things that I do want to just mention, Dave, because I thought your question was a good one, um, and, and the, the premise behind it is it seems like the goalposts get that they start moving a lot during this pandemic where it was slow the spread and then it was lots of different things. Um, for us, for me at least, uh, and I think everyone agrees with this, uh, our goal has always been to protect the integrity of our healthcare system, and the way in which you do that is you flatten the curve by slowing the spread. Um, and we did that in Mississippi from March when we had our first case on so March the 11th all the way up until the middle of June. You'll recall that for literally weeks and weeks on end, um, we were somewhere in the neighborhood in terms of uh, those on ventilators, for instance, between 60 and 90 patients throughout Mississippi. That was the case for weeks in the late spring and early to mid-summer. Well, and, and Dave mentioned that uh, now we're talking a lot about the seven-day average. The only reason I'm using the seven-day average is because I don't want to use any one-day number, uh, whereas today it was particularly high. On Monday, it was exceptionally low. And so that's the only reason I'm using the seven-day average is because I believe it's a good indicator from a mathematics standpoint of really what the spread actually is and, and really the direction that the spread is going. And so the, the other, so slowing the spread, maintaining the integrity of our healthcare system m remains my number one priority uh, because I don't believe we can uh, do anything as a government that makes this virus completely go away. I just don't see that as a, a realistic option. But I do want to point out that the other data points that are important with respect to that uh, do include, for instance, uh, on July the 30th, Mississippi had 989 confirmed patients uh, in hospital beds. Uh, as of uh, this morning, uh, on August the 18th, that number had fallen to 893. The good news is that's a approximately a 10% decline in total hospitalizations of confirmed patients. If you add in confirmed plus suspected COVID illness patients, it's actually down about 15% from its peak. That's the good news. The not so good news is for weeks and weeks and months on end from April until approximately mid-June, mid to late June, uh, our total hospitalizations were between 400 and 500. So even though we're down about 10 to 15% on total hospitalizations, we're still up 70% or so from where we had maintained for a long time. Now again, that is a lagging indicator. My expectation is at least for the next week or two, if we don't see uh, a major turn in the number of cases, that we'll continue to see 
down ticks in, in that area. The other number that I do want to point out is that um, obviously total number of patients in, in the ICUs is a very important data point as well. Uh, we peaked on August the 1st with 192 patients in ICU beds. Uh, that is 32 less today. So we're down to 160 patients in ICUs throughout Mississippi. Uh, that is again a, approximately a 15 to 20% decline. But again, 160 is still a lot higher than where we found ourselves in April and May and June and even in, up until late June when we were in that 70 to 90 and maybe tick up to 100 every now and then. And so we've got good positive movement, but we're still uh, need to continue to wear a mask, continue to socially distance because we need these numbers to be down another 30 or 40 or 50 percent to get back in that range where we were uh, just two and a half months ago. Yes, sir. Following up on the hospitalizations you're talking about, uh, we're approaching uh, flu season, and uh, Dr. Dobbs talked about this on Monday for a brief moment talking about immunizations, but what are your concerns, uh, and this Dr. Dobbs as well, as, I'd like to hear your talk on this, um, what are y'all's concerns on uh, going into flu season while we still have, while 800 is lower than it was at 900 last week, um, we're still high in hospitalizations and going into that season? Yeah, well, I'm hopeful the hospitalizations as a lagging indicator given that our numbers have been cut in half in the last two weeks. I am hopeful that our hospitalizations will continue to fall at least through the next couple of weeks, not knowing what the numbers are going to be uh, in terms of new cases, but I'm hopeful that that will continue to fall based upon what's happened in the last month, and that's a pretty significant downward trend in total cases. Uh, but in terms of the flu season, uh, a particularly bad flu season will put even more stress on our hospital system, and, and it's going to get really challenging if we have uh, COVID numbers uh, of patients in the 12 to 1300 range, that's gonna be really problematic. So what do we do to deal with that? Number one, Dr. Dobbs made this point a couple of days ago, I'll make it again. Um, if you can get the flu shot, get the flu shot. That would be, uh, I think, a wise decision if, if you and your doctor make the determination that that makes sense for you. Um, I'm certainly gonna get the flu shot uh, when it, um, when it makes sense to do so, and I hope that others will as well. Um, but obviously, uh, the the challenges that we face are, are that with, and this is uh, not news to anyone, but as we move into any season in which there are, are by definition, additional illnesses that have to be ultimately treated in our hospitals, it just adds complexity uh, to the virus. And I agree wholeheartedly. Um, just, we need everybody needs to get a flu vaccine. That's the easiest first step. Of course, we're very concerned about overwhelming the healthcare system. On a bad flu season, we max out hospital beds normally. So that's a challenge. And if we have coronavirus and flu and flu at the same time, that's something that worries us greatly. We've been working closely with the hospitals, hospital association, um, health systems to try to make some preparations with that in mind. Those planning scenarios. Um, and then some planning scenarios beyond that. The, um, the thing though that I just wanna reiterate is it's easy to beat COVID. We have just chosen not to do it. Um, if you're stay away from people and wear a mask and don't socialize, COVID will, it'll dwindle. But it's just, we have just chosen not to do it. And it's not, the, it's not it's nothing bad, it's, it's riding in the car with friends. It's going to dinner with friends. It, 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 it sounds like it's, it's very innocuous, but if it's outside of your nuclear family, there's risk involved, and that's what we're seeing in the colleges, and, and it, it's, it's just what it is, and um, we, just have, we have just chosen not to accept that as something we're willing to give up. Governor, following up on a comment you made a little earlier, you said that you had gotten tested within the last few hours. Are, are you just getting tested regularly because of who all you're coming in contact with, or do you believe you've had some recent exposures? No, I'm, it's, it's a relatively regular uh, testing regime. Um, I've actually was tested uh, within the last 24 hours and just got a test, back, test results back, so uh, I am negative uh, today. But as we've said, that doesn't mean I'm going to be negative tomorrow, and so let's just – um, let's just keep that in mind. But as, as President Trump once said, I got a positive result, which really means I, I tested negative for the virus. So, um, yeah. Speaking about colleges, how are you going to get college students on board? Nine times out of ten, they're probably not watching this briefing. They're probably not watching me on the news or anyone else on the news, and they're getting their news 
differently? How do you reach out to them to make sure that they're getting on board to not go to that party that's been a source of outbreaks in other states that's driving them to close camp college campuses now, in-person meetings? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I'd say I understand why they're not watching this briefing now. I don't understand why they're not watching you on the news. That makes no sense to me. But um, uh, I think we've got to continue to communicate in ways that, that they communicate. We, we do a decent job uh, communicating on the social media platforms, uh, whether it's um, Twitter or, um, or, or other platforms, the colleges. We've got to continue to use their platforms. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just – you know, it, it's a pretty monumental task whether kids are on their college campuses or if they're at home uh, to keep them, you know, keep 21 to 23, 24, 25-year-old kids from being 21 to 22, 23, 24, 25-year-old kids. That's just a hard thing to accomplish. And so uh, we've got to keep trying. We've got to keep working. We've got to be smart about it. Um, but it is, a, it is a monumental challenge without question. Can I pivot to the comments the Chicago mayor made about guns coming into her city from Mississippi and being behind a belief that that's led to violent crime. You, you responded on social media pretty strongly about that. Yeah, that that's, uh, uh, was an unfortunate comment. Um, those, uh, certainly we in Mississippi believe in the Second Amendment. Uh, we uh, believe in the right to keep and bear arms, and we certainly have uh, the ability to purchase uh, those firearms in our state, and we should. Um, what's happened is that in some cities around the country. And, and I'll point out that here in Mississippi, uh, number one, uh, we've had peaceful protests. Uh, we've had them f uh, we, uh, virtually every Saturday, different groups have protested uh, over the last three months. And we've had very peaceful protests. And while we have the same gun laws today that we had three months ago, uh, while we have seen some uptick in crime here in, in the city of Jackson, uh, it hadn't been driven or led within the, the protesting that has, has transpired. And so what I would say to anyone who wants to blame our, wants to blame Mississippians, the, the people of Mississippi for the increase in crime in the city of Chicago, that just, that, that doesn't pass the smell test. Uh, it doesn't make sense. It's just, quite frankly, it's a conspiracy theory that just doesn't work. And so the, the fact is that uh, there are cities around this country, whether it be Portland or Seattle, uh, maybe Chicago and others, uh, in which they've had a significant effort to defund the police. And, and, and the reality is, in those areas in which that has been the mantra of the leadership, it should not surprise them that they've had a significant uptick in violence and, and in some instances, um, unfortunately, uh, in, in the number of people that are getting shot, et cetera. Um, the, the fact in, in Chicago, I, I'm told that there was over 100 individuals that were shot um, in the month of July. Uh, Mississippi's laws with respect to firearms was the same in July of 2020 as it was in July of 2019, which is the same as it was in July of 2018. And so it's a ludicrous statement, and, and I think, look, it's a, it's a tough time for everyone, and so I'm not going to um, criticize the mayor, but that just – that just doesn't make any sense. Alex with Mississippi Today has a question. Hey, I'm wondering if you could say what days you're planning on doing the targeting, targeting testing in Choctaw, and then um, how do you keep, talk a little bit about how, how you decide which communities to do the targeting testing in? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna be um, uh, in Choctaw, Mississippi at the, um, at the uh, Silver Star, parking garage tomorrow Friday and Saturday so come on in get tested if you live in that area we're also going to do free antibody testing uh, for people who come in if they want it uh, optional uh, uh, we decide um, this is kind of a, a, a new thing obviously we did Lexington before and we're doing um, we're uh, working with the with the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians and they've been absolutely fantastic I just can't tell you how much I appreciate appreciate everything they're doing it's gonna be a great collaborative with their public health office um, but we, we choose it mostly on um, morbidity, right? So where the cases are um, and, uh, and mortality, and there certainly has been a lot of mortality. So we'll, we'll, we'll likely continue this effort. We're still learning. This is a little bit of a novel approach um, 
but it does give us a chance to really sort of try to suppress a hot spot when we can because we can devote resources as lab, case investigators, contact tracers so that we can do something, you know, near real time that's hard to maintain on a statewide basis when you have, you know, private labs coming back seven days, eight days later, or you're overwhelmed by the number of cases. So um, we're hoping this is a model that we can use going forward. Right. Okay, so my first question is about the case numbers. Do we believe we're seeing a big jump in cases because of increased testing? And I have a follow-up. My answer, and Dr. Dobbs may have a uh, have one as well. My answer is we we saw a big increase in numbers today because today is Wednesday, and it is not at all unusual for the entirety of the six months that Wednesdays and Thursdays and typically Fridays are a little bit larger than Saturdays and Sundays and Mondays. Um, so that is part of it. Uh, but the bigger issue and the bigger pro bigger challenges I see it is uh, if you look at last Wednesday compared to this Wednesday, we actually had about a 15% increase. And so we'll see what the next few days uh, bear out before we, um, before we make any final conclusions. But uh, I think the, the number today is more a, a factor of its, it is Wednesday than, than anything else, but let's see what happens tomorrow and Friday. And we'll continue to follow the, the date of onset. That's the most important measure if you look at our website because it does sort of flatten out some of that variability. Uh, I, do, I think part of it almost certainly is, is just this sort of week effect, you know, as it, as it varies around the weekend. Uh, but I'm worried because, you know, schools are starting back up, and could there be an, an impact from that? And we'll, we'll see. Um, as we see some of the age distribution numbers and do more investigations, we'll have more information in the next, uh, next days and weeks. Yeah, the, the date of onset of illness is critically important because, as we've said repeatedly, the, the actual total number of cases reported in any one day is less of an important indicator than is the date of onset of illness. And, and certainly, um, but, we'll, but we'll certainly watch it for the next few days. All right, and can you talk a little bit about the hospital data? I know you guys briefly mentioned it maybe a few minutes ago, and by looking at the state data, it seems like there is a downward trend. Can you speak a little bit about that and where we stand now in terms of that? Do you think we're doing pretty well in terms of that, even though we're seeing an increase in cases? Well, uh, we, the, the, we're not actually seeing an increase in cases if you look at the seven-day or five-day average. We saw a one-day of increased number of positive results today. Um, and so we're, we're still on a very downward trend in total number of new cases. Um, and if you look at date of onset of illness, if you look at the chart on the State Department of Health, um, the, even where we find ourselves in terms of today's seven-day average on the date of onset of illness, uh, the next 14 days as they currently are reported, are all below the current seven-day average. And so we're likely to see, uh, at worst, a flattening of where we are today, more so than a, um, but we could also see a, a downward, a continued downward sloping curve, but one that is not as steep as it has been, say, for the last 15 days. Um, in terms of hospitalizations, there is no doubt that we are on a uh, nearly, uh, 15 to 20 day decline in number of hospitalizations, number of ICU patients, and number of patients on the ventilator. Uh, we're in about a 15 day trend. Uh, I hope that continues and it needs to continue for another 30 to 45 days uh, so that we head back towards where we were three months ago. Um, the reality is if COVID were not an issue today, uh, there would be hospitals with capacity issues on ICU beds, et cetera, because, and the reason we know that is because every other year that has been the case. Um, we live in a rural state. Uh, we have a relatively small number of ICU beds. Um, and as uh, many of the administrators have made very clear to me repeatedly that, you know, all, uh, all ICU beds are not equal. Uh, and so you've got the, the level one trauma center and you've got uh, level two and level three facilities. But we, we are in a positive trend on hospitalizations. We need to continue that trend uh, because of what was mentioned earlier. As we move into the fall, uh, there are other risks out there other than COVID-19 that we're going to have to deal with. And so we need to be prepared for that. Yeah, and we're seeing, I'll tell you, we had 74 new confirmed admissions today for coronavirus. That's, that's great compared to where we were a few weeks ago. 
we are seeing, seeing real trends. I will add something. This is going to sound a little bit extreme, but as we go into this college thing, it's the older folks and the people who are sick that we worry about. And, and you know, if you have a kid in college, be careful. Be, be careful being around them, um, honestly, because that's going to be a real risk situation if you're going to visit your kids, even if they don't feel bad, they could give it to aunts, uncles, grandma, et cetera. So we need to be cautious about that. Well, and, and I think that's a, something that, that I'll say, and this is not from a, uh, an expert medical opinion, obviously, uh, having not gone to medical school, but if you have a kid that's off to Mississippi State or Ole Miss or MUW and they're staying on campus, um, uh, honestly, it, it's probably in your best interest and the best interest of uh, minimizing community spread if they stay on campus for the next two weeks or three weeks or four weeks. And, um, and I know that's uh, difficult uh, for many and difficult to hear, but uh, you've all seen me talk about this where we get into trouble is when you've got a lot of people that are out in the community that do not have the virus and a few that do and you go into one spot and those few people with the virus spread it to a lot of people and then they go back out and then boom, then we get into a challenge. And so if you have a kid that is at college, uh, I would strongly, strongly recommend that we assume that if they come back home, that we just assume that they are a positive for the virus. And of course, what we've said for the last four or five weeks, particularly six weeks, is we ought to just assume that everybody has it. And so that's why we should wear a mask no matter where we are. So if we, if we start by assuming that everybody in the state has it, and therefore we need to protect ourselves, by staying socially distanced, by wearing a mask, particularly when inside, but also when outside. Um, if you have a kid at college, that's a pretty good, pretty good rule to follow as well. The best case scenario is keep them on campus uh, for a long time, uh, because we know based upon morbidities and, and, and other um, statistics that if all of the kids that are on the campus, if, if they go through a cycle of getting the virus, um, and they don't come in contact with people that are over the age of 45 or 50 um, and don't spread it to that, that next generation, then while the virus is certainly can be very dangerous, it's, the risk is less amongst those groups. But it, when, if you get take 30 or 40 or 50 or three or 400 people with the virus in college that then go home and give it to their moms and give it to their grandmoms, we're gonna find ourselves uh, with challenges um, for those individuals, but also we're gonna be right back here a month and a half from now talking about how the curve has changed and the hospitalizations are going up and we've got challenges again. You had said earlier regarding the flu shot, you'll get it at the appropriate time. Dr. Dobbs, is it possible to take the flu shot too early in the season? When should people consider getting the flu shot then? I want it. You know, it's, it's a good question. Um, because you want to time it right when the flu gets here, but no one knows when, when the flu gets here, right? So it's kind of a, kind of a uh, darned if you do sort of thing. Um, soon, you know, I would suggest everybody start getting it by September. Um, the flu can come early. Um, even now is not too early. So um, I'm going to wait a little bit until we get our flu vaccine at the Department of Health just to be part of the team. I don't want to be sneaking out and getting it before everybody else gets it. Um, but as soon as I have access to it, I'm going to get it on day one. And that's it. That's part of the issue, I presume, is is you can't get a flu vaccine if the vaccines aren't at the at your physician's office or in your. And I don't know exactly how those when those come in, but they're and some are available now, I believe. But not every not everyone has availability now. Some people will get two flu shots. They'll get it early in the season and get a redone at the start of the next year. I just didn't know what your advice was. Um, uh, you know, it's not recommended, but it's not it's not wrong. Um, so uh, you know. Could it be beneficial? It could be beneficial, but it's just not a recommended practice. Hi, um, I am wondering, um, given that the schools are going to be reporting to the state health department directly their uh, coronavirus cases and the locations of outbreaks, um, why is the department not going to just release school by school information? as opposed to um, you know, combining the information and releasing county by county summaries of coronavirus cases at schools. We're still onboarding schools. There's 1,200 schools. We've got a lot of quality control issues. 
um, before we would put any individual school out there, uh, we would, well, first off, we would rather them have the control over it to release information to start with. Um, we feel more confident to, with the um, uh, grouped data by county at this time. Um, and I, but I think it's something that certainly will be available um, if needed, but we're still, we're just still validating data and getting the system working properly. Uh, but if you do have interest in a specific school, you know, reach out to them. I do hope schools will be forthcoming and share because every school is going to have coronavirus. You know, it's like, you know, every, you know, everybody, you know, g gets the flu sometimes. And so it's just going to be out there, but, um, we will continue to validate and improve our, our systems. But the 1200, getting 1,200 schools onboarded is a little bit of a challenge, but they've done a fantastic job, a couple of kinks to work out. Um, David, question. Okay, I apologize to everybody part of the state of uh, the coast, but I have to ask a non-existent DMR budget question, Governor. Uh, General Spragan says the agency is going to be in big trouble at the end of this month, big trouble. I'm assuming you're waiting for Lieutenant Governor Hoseman and the Speaker to assure you lawmakers are ready to make a deal before you call a special session, or it would just be a waste of time. But the clock is ticking, dozens of projects are on hold, and workers are nervous. Doesn't this have to happen yesterday? Dave, we are working on it. We are spending a, a good bit of time working on trying to find um, a solution uh, between the impasse uh, by the, the House and the Senate. Uh, I have been in, in contact with numerous members. I spoke with uh, Lieutenant Governor Hoseman uh, just, just the other day. Uh, there's a lot of uh, desire to get this done. Um, I am absolutely committed to uh, the men and women who work at the Department of Marine Resources. Uh, they have unfortunately gotten caught up in a political squabble uh, that they did nothing to deserve. Uh, but I am, we are continuing to have conversations, and I am hopeful to get uh, the uh, resolution between the House and the Senate very soon. But you're, you're right, the time frame is narrow. It doesn't have to be done yesterday. It should have been done by June 30, but it certainly needs to be done uh, within the next couple of weeks. Um, Emily with the Associated Press has a question. Hi, my question is for both Governor Reeves and Dr. Dobbs. Given the number of students and teachers who are in quarantine because of the coronavirus, are you comfortable with the school guidelines that you, Governor Reeves, and that the health department have issued, or do those guidelines need to be strengthened? Well, Emily, thank you for the question. I am comfortable with the guidelines as they currently exist. As I mentioned a couple of days ago, um, I would be much more concerned if we had nobody quarantined, then I am that we have around 2,000 individuals quarantined. What that tells me is that uh, the vast majority of schools and their leaders are taking this very seriously, and the quarantining of these students uh, allows for, uh, if you assume that we have 450,000 uh, students and teachers, approximately 2,000 quarantined, uh, what that tells me is 99.5% of those are, are either in the classroom or, or online learning. And the most important word there is that they are learning. And so are we going to have to tweak uh, our uh, guidelines over time? Are we going to have to continue to daily monitor uh, the data that we receive? And are we ultimately going to have to have conversations about shutting down schools? The answer is yes. We, we fully anticipate that um, because that is going to be uh, something that we have to consider uh, but it seems that the uh, reopening plans are, are being implemented and that uh, the, most of the schools are being very, very, very vigilant in their um, monitoring of COVID-19. Yeah, well, the only thing I'll add is, you know, we still would like to promote um, approaches that allow kids to be educated sp spaced from one another, right? Because we have that many kids quarantined, it means that that many kids were within six feet of another case for 15 minutes or more. So everything we can do either with alternate schedules or you know, using your, the space you have allocated to you to keep those kids from being in proximity, you're gonna decrease your quarantine numbers. 
So um, there's still opportunities to improve, I think. Um, I think some of the schools probably are surprised by the number of kids walking through the door with coronavirus. Um, but, you know, um, and, you know, it's happened pretty quickly. Um, but they're doing the exactly the right things. Um, if we want to keep it from getting totally out of hand, we got to be really thoughtful about making sure that we quarantine students and teachers that are exposed. Governor, you said you anticipate schools having to be closed. Are you, do you mean district by district or uh, as they come up? Yeah, I, I anticipate, not that they will necessarily be closed, I anticipate that we will get to a point in which there are uh, multiple positive cases in multiple different groups in an individual school and we have to at least have a conversation as to uh, does it make sense to close the school or should we just quarantine the entire class? Uh, those are the kind of conversations that I fully anticipate uh, that as we get into uh, the school year uh, that we'll have to have some of those conversations. It's not going to uh, surprise me at all if there is a school building, uh, and it may not be an entire school, it certainly wouldn't be an entire district unless it was um, multiple cases in multiple school buildings. Uh, and multiple wings in multiple school buildings. But yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there's not a point at which uh, the number of positive cases compared to the number of kids that need to be quarantined compared to the total number of kids in the school, that the ratio is such that it makes more sense just to shut down the school for a 14 day period. Um, can you go over the numbers again for today for teachers and students that oh, have yeah. the virus? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think you mentioned like uh, how many new cases there were. What are the totals? Yeah, this is for um, the week of August 10th through 14th, and we have total new positive COVID teachers and staff 84, total new positive students 132. These are new ones for that last week. Um, quarantined last week teachers and staff 328, and. Uh, uh, Students quarantined as of last week, 1,970. Can you repeat the totals for overall? Um, that is not on here, I'm sorry, but we will have that when we post it. And keep in mind, particularly on the quarantining, um, but also uh, I guess the total number of positive cases will continue to rise, rise, rise. The number of quarantine, every day there are going to be people who are, who are kids and teachers who had been quarantined that are no longer quarantined, and every day there's going to be kids and teachers that are added and so it's gonna it's gonna be it's not gonna be just simple math to determine okay well here's where we are on any one particular given week thank you Renee thank you governor this question is for you governor um, the there has been a few outbreaks not not exactly an outbreak would be the wrong word but a few cases uh, down in the city governments, officials down here on the coast, um, that has, I believe has been reported to the health department, at least according to your executive order, they should be reported to the health department. However, I don't believe that numerous cities have actually reported those workers or officials to uh, the public at least. And I'm wondering if there's any type of stance that you would like or something that, that we could do to inform the public when you're going up to, to pay your water bill or do something else as such, just to you know, for protection of public more than anything else. Yeah, well, well thank you. Um, obviously, uh, it is our position that if, uh, if there is a positive case uh, for the system to work the way it needs to work, then everyone, uh, those positive cases need to be reported to the health department so that the health department can do their work to ensure that if there's someone that works for a city that say for instance uh, is in the, the, um, the, the department that collects bills, a bill collecting department that is open to the public, well then those individuals they came in contact with need to know that they came in contact if it's for more than 15 minutes uh, with someone who is a positive test and so I don't know any of the specifics Hunter, I, I'll look into it, but um, that's certainly, we, we, we have to be transparent. Uh, that's critically important. We have to be transparent when we get a positive test to the health department, and then we have to be transparent to the public. And it's the very reason that, that we are having uh, these daily briefings at least three or four times a week is so that we can get information out to the public. 
Well, I believe it's 3.30. Uh, I want to thank everyone for being here today. We will come back tomorrow at 2.30. I do anticipate uh, having an announcement with respect to enhanced employment, unemployment benefits and, and, and our decision as a state as to whether or not we, uh, it, we take those um, so that we can get them to the people across the state. I also am working very diligently on uh, additional uh, executive order uh, with respect to the larger venues uh, on college campuses for athletic facilities, um, which again are different, uh, although similar, but different than high school facilities. So with that, uh, everyone stay safe out there and God bless.